All right, welcome to the video lecture for chapter six on telescopes. Uh, in the previous chapter, we talked a lot about the properties of light. We talked about how light and matter interact. This chapter is sort of a continuation of that. Now that we know how light is emitted, we need to understand how, as humans, we collect this light, analyze it, and uh, learn the things that we can about stars and galaxies from this light that we've collected. Um, this is all done through telescopes. The first telescope was created for astronomical purposes by Galileo in early 1610, and he used a very simple refracting telescope that utilizes a lens to collect light. Um, the picture that you see here is where we've come in all these years. This is a very large reflecting telescope. You can see a mirror at the bottom of this. It measures about eight meters in diameter. <clears throat> now, when it comes to understanding telescopes, um, we got to understand why we've built them to begin with. Um, the eye is very limited in what it can do to observe uh, things in space. So the telescope acts as basically a gigantic improvement over what the eye is capable of doing. So let's just go through some of those uh, improvements. Uh, you know, the human pupil is rather small. It's a few millimeters in diameter. And obviously that's not going to collect a lot of light, especially in, in, in uh, you know, nighttime uh, environments. So the telescopes are built to be very large. Um, the larger the telescope, the more light it can collect and the brighter things are going to be. Galileo had many... Uh, amazing discoveries with his telescopes. It uh, turns out that there's a lot of things in, our, in space, particularly our solar system, that are just barely not visible to the human eye because of our inability to collect enough light. Uh, now, if you build a telescope that is large to collect a lot of light, that will also mean that you will have a better resolution in your images. You will see more detail in things. That's obviously very valuable. Cameras uh, that are put on telescopes can take long exposures, so you can collect light over a longer period of time. That just um, you know, allows for better light collection. And we can build cameras that are sensitive to wavelengths of light that the human eye can't do. You know, human vision is from blue to red in the optical spectrum, but we have instruments that can collect light in the infrared and the ultraviolet. And there's a lot of really valuable information that uh, appears at those wavelengths. Uh, this particular telescope here is a pretty standard research quality telescope. Uh, it's very large. Just for comparison, you can see a person that is uh, standing up on the right-hand side of this telescope. This is uh, one of the Gemini telescopes that is on the Big Island of uh, Hawaii on Mauna Kea. And the way this thing operates is this giant dome is here specifically for the telescope. It's climate controlled, dust controlled. There are absolutely no lights on when this thing operates. You know, you're normally used to seeing a tube uh, on a telescope, which is designed to do all those things, keep out light and the elements. But um, because of the environment here, everything's controlled. There's no need for a giant tube. So the slit of the dome opens up, the telescope points to the location in the sky that it wants to see, and what happens is the light comes down from the sky and it first comes in contact with this gigantic mirror. The mirror is shaped in an appropriate way so that the light will reflect off of it and come up to a secondary mirror, which is at the top, supported by this truss here. Uh, that will, uh, the light will reflect off of that mirror and then go through a hole that's in the primary that you see at the bottom here where the light is then redirected to any number of instruments that are down at the bottom of this thing that we call the optical bench. So this is how this particular telescope is collecting light. It's a couple reflections where the light comes to a focus and then enters into an instrument where the light is collected. Let's see what the different designs we have for telescopes. Now, as I mentioned, the original design for the telescope was what was accomplished by Galileo. He took glass and shaped it in an appropriate way to create a lens. What the lens allows you to do is to take some of the light that comes from an object. Now, the light that comes from objects generally diverges away from the object, and the information uh, can, about what the object was like can be lost unless you can 
have some means to collect some of that light and bring it back down to a point. It came from a point, and if you can bring that light back down to a point, then you can recreate um, uh, the object through an image of the object. Um, what's seen in the picture here is uh, the distance from where the lens is located to where the image is formed is what we call the focal length. And uh, that's what this lens is doing. It's glass. It very much acts like a prism, and it bends light. And if the lens is shaped in an appropriate way, the bending of that light can bring that uh, down to a focus that's located at the focal length. And usually have you have, you, uh, you have your eye here, or you can have your... Uh, camera here and as long as you uh, adjust uh, for view viewing this image here either for your eye or for the camera you can collect that uh, that image the picture you see on the bottom left here is a very sort of typical appearance of a modern refracting telescope they're usually quite long that's how you can tell the difference between refracted and reflectance generally is because of the size of the tube uh, the light enters the front here where the lens is located, and then the, the telescope tube is very long because the focal length of these telescopes are usually very long. Um, a lot of commercial telescopes are refracting. There are basically no modern astronomical, like research quality telescopes that use refraction uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, the lens is um, a continuous piece of glass, and it is more challenging to build and maintain as the size of the lens gets large. I mean, I mentioned in the previous slide that we were looking at the Gemini telescope, which is eight meters. Eight meters would be something uh, around, you know, close to 30 feet um, in size. You can imagine a 30-foot lens is very, very difficult to create and maintain. So um, that's one disadvantage. The other disadvantage, as you can see the picture down on the right here, is that um, because it's a lens, it is does act like a prism, and it will produce the bending of light differently for different wavelengths. So this picture of Mars, while it's a pretty pretty picture of Mars because it's all rainbowy, unfortunately Mars doesn't look rainbowy. Um, this is called chromatic aberration. This is the fact that different colors are brought to focus at different locations on the image and. Uh, and that's just not an accurate depiction of what Mars looks like. No matter how pretty it may look as a rainbow, it's uh, not useful if the light is basically causing this to blur and produce different colors. So, um, like I said, you can buy telescopes like these, but you really don't see these used for uh, in professional astronomy. Instead, uh, professional astronomy utilizes reflecting telescopes for their use. Now... The reflecting telescope, it utilizes a mirror that can reflect light. And if the mirror is shaped in an appropriate way, you can accomplish the same thing you can do with the refracting telescope. You can bring the light down to a focus. Um, it's easier to construct a uh, reflecting telescope for several reasons. Um, the uh, telescope need, only needs a reflective surface. It doesn't have to be a continuous piece of something. Uh, it just needs to have a coating of some kind that can allow for the reflection. And so uh, that's a little bit easier to make. You can actually make these things in segments. So this picture on the upper right here is uh, one of the earlier concept models for the James Webb Space Telescope that is currently up and it uses this kind of honeycomb structure where they have segmented mirrors and it just allows it, the telescope to have a much um, larger design. It's easier to, to put the pieces together to make the telescope as large as you want it to be. So um, that's a huge advantage. There's no chromatic aberration. Reflection is not wavelength dependent. So you don't have to worry about that. So um, just a much more convenient design. Uh, the picture on the left here is a picture of what a modern commercial reflecting telescope looks like. It's a little more compact. Um, the reason why, as you can see in the picture down here, the focal length is in front of the mirror. So where the way this telescope works is the light come in, comes in through the aperture here then hits the mirror that sits in the back of it. That light's reflected up, and then you can see in the aperture here, there's a little, uh, you can see some support for a secondary mirror and that redirects the light out of the eyepiece, which comes out to the side here. 
And so because it's reflected in the telescope, you can make the design a lot more compact. These tend to be larger in size, so they have counterweights on them to support the fact that the back end of the telescope is so heavy because that's where the mirror is located. But um, yeah, that's all research quality telescopes today uh, use reflecting for their designs. All right, so those are the two main designs for the telescope. What we want to understand now is, I mean, what makes one telescope better than another telescope? I mean, if we want to continue to build telescopes to study things in space, what kind of things are we thinking about to make our telescopes better? So we actually talk about uh, powers that telescopes have. And there are three main powers that telescopes have that allows you to compare one telescope to the other. And I'm going to have these in order of their importance. The first and most important power of a telescope is what's known as the light gathering power or LGP of the telescope. It is the ability of a telescope to make objects appear brighter. Um, this is directly related to the surface area of the mirror or the lens where the light falls upon. And the larger you make these mirrors or lenses, the more light you can collect. And so we say that the light gathering power, LGP, is directly related to diameter squared. So the diameter is the size of the mirror or lens. And because we are referring to an area that the light falls onto, area is goes as diameter squared. So that's how we usually speak of um, the size of telescopes is how large is their mirror or their lens. So that's how we make comparisons. And obviously you want to collect as much light as possible. So it's real simple here. Just make the telescope as big as you can possibly make it. The telescopes, um, the largest optical telescopes in the world are around 10 meters. Um, the Keck Observatory, which is in Mauna Kea, I did all my research at the Keck Observatory. That was a 10 meter telescope. And it's still to this date, uh, one of the larger optical telescopes in the world. There are plans for bigger ones, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in the lecture here. All right, so question for you. Uh, if I want to compare the light gathering power of a 5-meter telescope to that of a 1-meter telescope, how would they compare? So I'll give you a minute to think about this. And the answer is B. So light gathering power goes as diameter squared. So we are going to take the five and squared and the one and squared and create a ratio out of that and we get 25. What does 25 mean? It means that the five meter telescope has 25 times the amount of area compared to the one meter telescope. It could collect 25 times the amount of light compared to the one meter telescope. Objects will appear 25 times brighter in that telescope compared to a one meter telescope. So uh, simple comparisons you just need to take a ratio of the diameter squared, and that's how you're able to compare one telescope to another one, just in terms of size. There are other powers. Another power of a telescope is what we call the resolving power of the telescope. This is the ability of a telescope to reveal fine detail if that's even possible to see. Now, a lot of times we take telescope images of things that don't have any detail, like stars or pinpoints of light. There's no real detail to see there, but nebula, galaxies, um, image in planets, there is detail there. And, you know, obviously we wanted to be able to see uh, as fine of a detail as possible. You can see this on the right-hand side here, uh, an example of what it means to have a high versus low resolving power. Because obviously the picture in the upper right is a higher resolution image. It looks much clearer to us, there's more detail there. And the one on the bottom is a lower resolution image. You can literally see the pixels in that image. This kind of comes down to like pixel size, basically. I mean, uh, the image on the upper right here contains far more pixels and they're much smaller. And each pixel contains a little bit of information about, uh, about the nature of, the, uh, of what's being imaged here. And if the pixels are large, um, that obviously won't contain as much information. And we have a similar concept when it comes to viewing things in astronomy. Uh, the idea of pixel size is related to angular size. And the question is really, what is the smallest angular size that your telescope allows you to see? 
Now, you might remember from our discussions back in chapter 2 when I first mentioned angular size that the human eye's ability to resolve detail, uh, we can see detail down to an arc minute. And that's an extraordinarily small angle already, um, an arc minute. Um, so, I mean, the moon is 30 arc minutes, right? So uh, you are able to see a lot of detail in the moon because it's much larger than that. And that's kind of what I mean by minimum angular size, because if something is smaller than the limit of the eye or the telescope, then details get kind of blended together and you don't really, uh, you can't make out that stuff. So, I mean, like if you're looking at the slide right here and you're able to make out all the letters, the spaces between the letters, you can read the words and everything. That means all of these symbols are above the resolving power of your eye. But if you step back far enough away from the screen, at some point you're going to be at a distance where you cannot make out the words because now the angular size of them has dropped below the limit that your eye can do and you just can't see that stuff anymore. So same thing applies to a telescope. We want to produce the smallest angular size that is possible by that telescope. And there are two factors that determine this. Now we want this quantity to be small, small as possible. So there is wavelength dependence. There's a direct relationship with wavelength. That means wavelengths that are short are going to have better resolving ability than wavelengths that are long. And then we are it's inversely related to the diameter of the telescope. And again, we want the quantity small, so we would want a large diameter telescope. So you can already see here there are two important factors, and they both want the diameter to be as large as possible. So you can probably see where we're going with what kind of telescope we want to have here. Uh, this is a good uh, illustration of the wavelength dependence on resolving power. Now, the image on the right here is that of the Whirlpool Galaxy. This might be the first time I'm showing you this picture. Um, I will probably show you this picture 20 other times because there's just so much interesting things going on with this image. And um, it's just beautiful. Um, there's so much detail here. And... We're able to see that detail because we got Hubble. It's in space. It observes at visible wavelengths. Hubble is a 2.4 meter diameter telescope, which is not bad for something that's in space. And we got this nice crisp image of our Whirlpool galaxy here. Now, on the other side is we have an image of the Whirlpool galaxy, and it's taken with the Spitzer Space Telescope. Now, the Spitzer Space Telescope is sort of an analog for Hubble, but it is designed to work at infrared wavelengths. It's not quite as large as Hubble, so there is a diameter dependence, but the more significant factor is that it operates in the infrared, and it, it operates at wavelengths that are almost 10 times larger than what the Hubble is able to do, and that means that the resolving power is going to drop as a result of that, um, and as you can see in the image here, it just doesn't look as crisp and clear as the one for Hubble, and you may be asking yourself, well, why are we taking this image then? I mean, if there's more detail in the visible wavelength, then why would you take the infrared one? Well, it's a different wavelength of light. And there's information in the infrared that you just can't get in the visible part of the spectrum. So it just allows you to get information that otherwise is harder to do. And when Spitzer was designed, the, the limitations that scientists knew it had uh, were fine. Um, we're still able to do a lot of good science with it, even though it doesn't probably sell as many, uh, as, as many calendars as the Hubble images do. Um, the Spitzer Space Telescope still doing amazing work in space. All right, now I have a question for you here, and this question is more like, um, it's kind of more of a guess on your part, just kind of an educated guess now based on um, what we uh, just talked about here. Um, so the Arecibo Observatory, um, it is the world's largest single aperture telescope. It is not an optical telescope, okay? Uh, largest optical telescopes, as I mentioned, around 10 meters. Arecibo is much larger than that. And what do you think the wavelength it operates at? Just based on the discussion of resolving power, try to take a guess as to what um, wavelength you think this operates at. I'll give you a minute to think about that. All right, the answer here is radio. So how would you come upon that? Well, the idea is that radio is the longest wavelength of light. So the longest wavelength of light should have a pretty 
poor ability to resolve detail because minimum angular size is directly related to wavelength. So how do you try to combat the fact that the wavelength is really ruining resolution? What you do is you create gigantic telescopes. So the Arecibo telescope is huge. It's built into the hillside here. This is in Puerto Rico. And this is a football field across. I think it's 330 meters, I believe, is the diameter of this thing. It's absolutely enormous. And it's built large because, one, it's radio waves. And it's easy to build a large dish for a radio wave because it's just uh, the reflective surface of the radio wave is just metal. It doesn't have to be, you know, glass or, you know, or... Uh, or a mirrored surface, it's the metal is just fine to use. And so light comes down, radio waves come down and hit this dish and it goes up to the receiver that's up here. And, um, and uh, that receiver uh, can move around a bit. Um, this thing is built into the, uh, the hillside here, so it, it is limited in what it can view. Basically, it's just whatever the earth points at for it. Um, but that's, that's the trade-off. You can build a gigantic um, dish um, but the trade-off is you can't really move it as freely as you'd like to do. Unfortunately, by the way, this uh, this um, this is no longer operational. Uh, it was damaged by a hurricane back in 2017, and in 2020, um, some of the cables broke on it and actually smashed through uh, the dish. And this is actually what the picture looks like today. Um, kind of looks like something out of a futuristic video game or something. But yeah, the, dam the dish is damaged pretty badly, and there was a decision recently to not rebuild it. So this is not going to be a telescope for us anymore. They're going to turn this into an educational facility last th time I heard. Um, one, thing that's, one of the things that's kind of unfortunate about this is that um, uh, this SETI was using this telescope. They were kind of piggybacking off of the, some of the observations that were being made to uh, send and receive signals from space in an attempt to communicate with extraterrestrials. Um, we'd send signals out to different star systems and we would listen um, at, uh, at signals from space to uh, as an attempt to communicate. And uh, this is broken now, so we're not doing that with this. Um, well, we have other means to do this, but the, the method that we were using for a while is no longer around now. So. All right, the last detail, the last power of a telescope. And this is number three, and it is the least important power of the telescope. This is the ability of a telescope to make an object appear larger, the magnifying power. Now, you may think to yourself, well, that sounds good, because if you magnify something, shouldn't it look you know, clearer to you? Actually, no. Uh, magnifying power is literally just make the object bigger to us. It does not improve resolution um, necessarily. Uh, you could see in the image in the bottom here, this is an image of Saturn taken with a kind of a standard commercial quality telescope. And, um, you know, you, you could see the small image of Saturn here and it's difficult to make out what's really going on there. You can swap out the eyepieces of the telescope to improve the magnifying power. And they did that here, but look what we have. We just have a larger picture of Saturn, but it's blurrier, it's fainter, and um, the amount of detail doesn't just dramatically improve. The only time you actually can improve detail by magnifying something is if, you know, already you were, you had details that were below the mag, the, below the resolving power of what you currently had, and then you could magnify it to then see what is already present, actually. Um, but now, because like that's what they're showing in the magnifying glass here. Uh, there was detail to be seen, but we need an additional device to expose that. So uh, in a regular telescope image, though, um, the resolving power is separate from magnifying power. So, And for pro professional telescopes, the magnifying power is pretty much set in stone. They, they have the optimal magnifying power for the resolution they're able to do. It's never really altered in any way. The commercial telescopes have eyepieces that can change that. But it's not a concern for a professional telescope because, again, they've kind of locked in the optimal magnifying power to see the resolution that's present. So, um, all right. So we have these three powers. So what, what seems to matter here? Well, the size matters. 
you want a telescope as large as possible. So that's what we want to do. We want to build telescopes as big as possible. But putting telescopes on the Earth creates limitations to those powers, right? You don't want to put a telescope anywhere you want to on the Earth. It's going to be bad. I did my research. Um, well, my graduate degree was at UCLA. And I did some of the observing classes for the undergraduates there. And we had to be careful when we did our observations uh, because of the conditions of the sky. Uh, in particular, I had to see if the Lakers had a home game because if they did, then the Staples Center would um, produce a lot of purple light <laughs> and the sky looks purple and that's not good for astronomy. So LA in general is just not a good place to do astronomy, but, um, but you know, you can do some things obviously. Uh, the point being is that LA is bad because of an effect called light pollution. Light pollution is basically light that's being emitted from things on the ground that reflect up into the sky and makes the sky not as dark as it ought to be. And the sky is not as dark as it ought to be, then fainter things in the sky become lost. You can't see them. That's why in the Alp Valley, where I'm recording this from, we can see down to maybe magnitude three stars while the human eye should in principle be able to see down to say five or six magnitudes, but we can't because of the light pollution that exists. Now, this is a picture of the continental United States and it's kind of a map of where all the light pollution is located. And as you can see here, not many places that you can be that's like super remote. Um, the darkest areas are Nevada but a lot of Nevada is off limits. There's a lot of military stuff and federal land there. Uh, we got Vegas in the bottom here, and Vegas really wipes out a lot of things. Uh, Northern Arizona actually has a series of telescopes. That's probably the most popular place currently where telescopes are being built and used. It's high elevation, high-ish elevation, and it's kind of remote. I think it's actually a good location for telescopes. But this area is really not good overall. Um, other places you want to put telescopes, I mentioned I did my research on the Big Island of Hawaii. Well, that's good for two reasons. One, it contains a very tall mountain. You're above 10,000 feet when you're on Mauna Kea. It's also an island, so it's remote in that sense. Um, the remoteness is good for the light pollution, um, and mountaintops are actually good for several reasons. You can avoid a lot of atmospheric effects and other types of weather i mean it wasn't great i mean that time at keck it would snow it would be wind that is so bad we couldn't operate the telescopes but this place where they built the keck telescope was known to be a location that had what we call good seeing good seeing means minimal atmospheric turbulence so the atmosphere really messes things up for us you know when i mentioned the resolving power of telescopes the resolving power of the telescope is never actually achieved by a telescope on the ground. And the reason why is because the atmosphere blurs things. So you're trying to choose a location where you can get as close as possible to the true resolving power of the telescope. And mountaintops are a good place for that. Um, at least Keck was known to be a good a place of good seeing. Here's a comparison of seeing here. Um, these are two different images of Jupiter um, taken with a particular equipment in different seeing conditions. So, um, you know, the one on the right is really bad seeing, and the one on the left is good. I mean, you see a lot more detail in the one on the left. Uh, the atmosphere was a lot more turbulent then. It could be due to big temperature differences in the air, uh, humidity. There's all so many factors that determine... Um, good or bad seeing so uh, you want to try to choose a location where you can get the best seeing as possible and that usually has to be done by by tests and things like that you go out to the site you kind of observe how the atmosphere is behaving over long periods of time and you get a sense of how seeing is um, of course even good places for seeing uh, won't produce the best images as possible so what we need sometimes is um uh uh, a system to correct for the atmosphere. 
And this is uh, what's known as adaptive optics. And virtually all serious professional uh, astronomical observatories operate with an adaptive optics system on it. And the way the way the system works is either through software or hardware, it can adjust uh, the way the light's being collected to cancel atmospheric effects. So what you see on the right hand side here, they're showing a guide laser. So the way this guide laser works is it shoots up into the atmosphere. And when the beam goes up, it's a very, you know, organized, coherent beam of light. We know exactly what it looks like when it leaves. But then that light goes through a significant portion of atmosphere and it will reflect off the atmosphere and come back down. And we'll see the reflected beam. And we compare what went out with what comes back. And obviously what comes back is altered by the atmosphere. Again, we either through software after we collected the light or physically at the telescope, we can actually reshape the, 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 the mirrors on the telescope. In fact, a lot of the way this is done is the, the secondary mirrors are smaller and they can be adjusted. So, I mean, reshaped basically to cancel out the atmospheric distortions that take place. And then you can bring the telescope down very close to what it would look like if you were in space or if you had no you know, atmosphere to disturb things. Um, the show, what's being shown in the picture here is um, there's a source of light that the scene was bad enough that it looked like a, a single object here, but adaptive optics was turned on and we're canceling, all, canceling out a lot of the smearing and the distortion that occurs in our images. And we actually able to see this as a binary star system, very close together, but that would have otherwise been, been lost. Um, so adaptive optics is a really important um, aspect of that. There's a video link at the bottom here. I'll put it in the description, but it shows an example of how an adaptive optics system was put on um, the large binocular telescope in, um, I think in Northern Arizona. So I'll put a link in the description so you can see um, how that one particularly works. Um, so obviously if um, you could be in space, you would be in space. So um, there's so many advantages to being in space. Uh, the atmosphere really does mess up a lot of things when we're trying to do astronomy. Um, and NASA generally tries to keep up in space um, telescopes that have the ability to look at every part of the electromagnetic spectrum that really can't properly be observed from the ground. And this is a project at NASA called the Great Observatories. There is the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory for gamma rays. Chandra works at X-rays. We have Spitzer which works in the infrared, and the new James Webb Space Telescope also works in the infrared. Hubble can operate at ultraviolet and visible light. Uh, there's another telescope up that can do ultraviolet light. Um, we don't really need, I mean, Hubble's good for visible light. We don't need radio telescopes in space. Um, there are different types of microwave telescopes in space too. Uh, microwaves not usually as valuable as the other wavelengths of light, but at times there have been microwave um, space telescopes up. So, um, you know, huge advantages to being in space, huge advantages to being in space. Now, I'm getting to give you a list of some of these advantages. I want you to look over this list and I want you to decide for yourself, what do you think is not an advantage of a space telescope over a ground-based telescope? Think about this for a minute. All right, the answer is C. You're not closer to the stars when you have a space-based telescope. Okay, I wanna make sure it's really clear that stars are extraordinarily far away and having a telescope in space does not make you closer to them. Um, telescopes typically orbit the Earth or orbit the sun with the earth and you know we're talking about distances that are you know hundreds of thousands or millions of kilometers and you got to remember the closest stars to us are like tens of 
trillions of kilometers. So being up in orbit around the Earth is not put you closer to the stars. We don't, telescopes don't travel to the stars or galaxies. They just sit outside of our atmosphere and they make their observations. But being outside the atmosphere allows you to view wavelengths that you normally could not see from the ground. You have no atmosphere to bug you. So that means no light pollution, no atmospheric turbulence. You don't have a day-night cycle when you're in space. So you can observe 24-7. Um, you don't have weather in space. No, no rain or snow or clouds to obscure what you're doing. Obviously, it's more expensive to launch things in the space. Um, it's difficult to do maintenance on things when they're in space. It's almost impossible to do that. So there are disadvantages as well, obviously. But if we, it's getting cheaper to get things in the space these days. And so we'll probably see a lot more telescopes in space um, for this reason. Now, I mentioned the James Webb Space Telescope. This is the big deal. This was launched about a year ago. So this video is being recorded in 2023. So about a year ago is when the James Webb Space Telescope was launched. Um, and this is, you know, this, a, a lot of the results so far are still kind of preliminary. There has been really interesting things that come out of it. But um, the James Webb Space Telescope was really designed to be so the scientific successor of the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble worked, like I said, primarily in the visible light and ultraviolet. It did at a time have the ability to do infrared. But a lot of the work that was done on Hubble kind of created the science goals for James Webb. And James Webb has been designed to primarily work in the infrared because working in the infrared does allow you to see deeper in the space. I mean, the farther things are away, the more redshifted things are. And this is due to the expansion of the universe. So things that Hubble once studied in visible and ultraviolet light, well, if they're sufficiently far away, those wavelengths are redshifted and they are going to start to appear in the infrared. So if you're going to see deeper into space, you really need to start working more in the infrared. And that's what the James Webb Space Telescope is doing. It is larger than Hubble. You can see the comparison on the right here. Uh, James Webb can collect uh, six and a quarter times more light than uh, the HST. And the orbit of the James Webb Space Telescope is a bit different. Um, James Webb is said to operate at what's called the L2 Lagrangian point. Uh, that's a point of gravitational stability that exists in the Earth-Sun system. And the L2 point is a point that is in opposition to the Sun, so it's in, so relative to the Earth, it's in complete opposite side of the sky relative to the Sun, and it's located about 1.5 million kilometers away. That distance is I don't know, something like uh, maybe four or five times further away than the Moon is. And you can see the Hubble's orbit in comparison, vastly, vastly different. So there's a lot of advantages to being out here. Like I said, Lagrangian points are gravitational stable sta uh, stable points. So as the Earth orbits, uh, the James Webb Space Tels Telescope always stays in the same location, right behind the Earth relative to the Sun. Um, because it's so far away, uh, the shield that you see on the bottom of this is able to, uh, you know, avoid any kind of reflections or interference that come from the sun or the earth or the moon. So being out in L2, it's going to be away from a lot of interference. It's also needs to be very cool because it does infrared observations. And so um, being farther away is going to ensure that the telescope is much cooler um, to do those observations. So this is the future. Um, like I said, it's very new at the time of the recording of this video, but um, we're going to see some big things happening in two years, five years, 10 years. Uh, this is really going to revolutionize um, the the kind of science we know. Um, I mean, give you some examples here. I mean, already there was some observations of some very distant galaxies that seem to have star formation that occurred much more rapidly than it was supposed to. That's sort of indicating that we're probably wrong about when galaxies might have originally formed in the early solar system. Um, it's definitely going to be testing our ideas of dark matter, dark energy. Um, there was just a story that came out recently about the James Webb potentially detecting a compound in an exoplanet that is believed to be formed by life. Um, very likely, a lot of the exoplanets that we know right now will be followed up by the James Webb Space Telescope, and we will potentially 
find planets that are habitable, maybe find planets with signs of life on them. Um, it's very possible in the course of James Webb's work that that's going to happen. So, um, so exciting things are going to come in the future with this thing. Here's a good comparison on the quality uh, of, of Hubble versus uh, of James Webb. Um, the picture on the left was uh, a very famous picture that Hubble took. In fact, this is a kind of a second image that Hubble took of this region. There was an older one that was still very impressive, but you can just see the detail is just dramatically different. Um, There's just so much more going on in the image on the right here. So, All right, so um, we collect our light. And how exactly is this recorded? Well, Galileo first did his stuff. He created sketches of things. And, you know, you're looking through the telescope with your eye. And if you want to record what you see in a way to communicate to another person, you have to draw what you saw. In fact, you're a good astronomer back then if you were also a good artist and you can accurately draw out the things that you saw in your telescope. This is a sketch of the Whirlpool Galaxy. And this is the Hubble image of it. So, you know, not too bad, actually, to, in terms of the communication of what's being seen in there. But you got to imagine a sketch. It's not really a lot of information that you're going to see uh, in a sketch. Um, and this is, like I said, 1610, all the way up to the middle part of the 19th century. Um, astronomy was done through drawings, basically. What changed in the middle of the 19th century was the ability to take images. Uh, the first astronomical image ever taken was the moon. It actually was taken, there was one taken in 1839, but it was destroyed in a fire. There was one taken in 1840, and this is what I could find for that image here. This is the first you know, image, astronomical image really ever that, that we still have today. It's, it's of the full moon. It looks pretty good, actually. 1840, it's just wild that they're able to do that stuff, even far back then. Um, and this was the primary means to collect light and uh, record it um, up until about the 1970s. Um, this is done with photographic plates, film, basically. Um, the nice thing about film is that film is a chemical reaction. It involves crystals that are rather, rather small, so it could actually collect a lot of detail. Um, colors initially were kind of hard to do. Um, in fact, you could see this is what's called a negative image of uh, is an interacting galaxy here. And uh, the negative image is nice because uh, it's easier to see dark things on a lighter background. And so that the, the, you know, the film allows you to do that. Uh, the, the person on the left here, it's, um, he's using what effectively is a microscope to view the telescope image. Um, the film is usually rather small, so you needed a device to sort of see the detail there. I mean, it's an improvement over drawing, but you can imagine, like, it's effectively, it's still a Polaroid, you know, how, how much science can you do with that? I mean, you get a lot of spatial information, and that's fantastic. What changed in the 1970s was uh, things went digital. Uh, the CCD device, which is, the, which is pretty much how most digital cameras work these days. It's CCD means charge couple device. And, you know, you could see the CCD uh, here in this image. Uh, what the CCD is, is basically a, a array of very small pixels. And inside these pixels are um, chemicals that can absorb photons of light and read out the photon detection as an electrical signal. And it's, so it's a lot more sensitive than a photographic plate in the sense that it literally counts photons. I mean, every time a photon hits, there's a little electrical signal that's let out. And so you imagine this gigantic array of cells, these pixels, and every time one gets hit, a little number is registered. And you can create what you see on the right here. This is an image where it's broken up into millions and millions of pixels, and every pixel has a number. How many photons hit me? And uh, that allows you to create these nice digital images. Now, digital images are great because you can do a lot more analytical things with them. They're more quantitative. I mean, they're literally counting photons. 
you can display them much easier. You can alter the contrast and the colors, and you can just highlight a lot of details that otherwise are hard to see in a, in a photograph. And this is how everything is done today. Um, and you know, CCDs were originally made for optical devices, visible wavelengths. Now we have them work in the other wavelengths. Uh, when I did my research, that was right when they started to do infrared CCDs. This was like early 2000s when they were doing the infrared CCDs. So um, this is a big deal. When I, when, I, when I go out to do my research, I would leave there with you know either a giant set of magnetic tapes or DVDs, and they're just filled with files. Each image was a file. And I would actually spend a very long amount of time coding um, a software that would um, process these images and display them. In fact, a huge amount of my time was, was writing computer code to, to do this stuff. All right, so um, what's the future um, of observing? Well, there's really two directions we're taking this. Um, one is keep building bigger telescopes. Um, the biggest one in uh, development right now is called the ELT. It means Extremely Large Telescope. I don't, I don't know what these names are about, but that's just, they're being silly with the names, but whatever, that's just an extremely large telescope is the name. And that will probably be the official name when it goes up. But it's uh, in the Atacama da Desert of, um, of Chile. And, uh, and um, it's, you know, the desert is one of the driest locations on Earth. So good atmospheric sea in, semi-high elevation, dry climate. Uh, it's supposed to have a almost 40 meter mirror that's like gosh almost 130 feet in size you can see the little tiny truck down here for comparison um that would be like 10 times better than what Keck can do um very challenging to do i mean you know this thing is probably the size of almost the size of like a baseball field so you got to imagine the engineering difficulties and, and having an object that's that large and it moves too you got to minimize vibrations and all kinds of other factors. So that's very challenging. And I, last time I heard, this is supposed to be up in 2028. So that will be a big improvement. Uh, there is ultimately a limitation to this stuff. I mean, you can't, they're, tr they're talking about trying to build a 100 meter telescope. And I don't know if that's ever going to happen. At some point, things are just too big and, and they're not going to work uh, in the gravitational field of the Earth. So you got to put more stuff in this space. Uh, what you see on the bottom here is an array that already exists. It's called the VLA, Very Large Array. It's in New Mexico, and it's a series of radio telescopes that's referred to as an interferometer array. So what it is is that the telescopes, they collect signals from space, but they do so at the exact same time, but from different locations. And they combine those signals together mathematically to produce a telescope image that would be equivalent of something that is much, much larger than the telescopes. Um, uh, just because, you know, like I said, if you put, imagine a gigantic telescope that's just broken up into these pieces and the pieces combine together and it's like you have a much larger telescope. And so this is something that we put into practice today for radio telescopes, but it's something that can be designed for telescopes at any wavelength. And, um, you know, the image of the black hole that they produced a few years back in M83, that was done with a interferometer. Uh, there was a series of telescopes that took that data. So that would be the future because you don't have to make big telescopes, but you have to make many telescopes and you have to be able to combine those signals together. And we're probably going to see interferometry arrays in space more often, and that's probably going to be a big part of the future of astronomy. So, All right. Well, I think that wraps it up for uh, this video lecture. Um, what's really exciting about the end of this particular lecture here is that you know we spent a long time building up uh, all of these tools and information about, you know, different physical laws, properties of light, you know, how we collect light, all this stuff. And, and we're just ready to apply it. And, and that's where we're going to do now. The next chapter is chapter seven. We're going to jump right into the solar system and start studying objects in space. So the background information is kind of over with now. And then we can really get into the meat of the class. So, all right, that's it.